Went too far. Hey everybody, um, today's gonna be a little bit different. So in the early days of my channel, I answered questions from my audience, hence the name Answers with Joe. Uh, it kind of got away from that after a while, but there is a level in Patreon above which you're supposed to be able to get a question answered in a video. That's like the perk. And um, I've been terrible about that. So today I'm gonna answer questions from people like you on Patreon. So there's gonna be several different answers here, different questions that I'm answering, uh, sort of a lightning round video. But if there's any of the topics that you want to see me expand on, let me know down in the comments. It could become a full video of its own. Anyway, that's all you need to know. Gonna be a little bit different, but it'll still be a lot of fun. Let's get to the questions. Our first question comes from John Regal. He asks, does having a sense of the true size of the universe through the Answers with Joe subject matter make you feel more or less significant? Cool, let's start with something easy. All right, so I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah, it, it, it messes with my head a little bit. My worldviews changed a lot in the time that I've been doing this channel, not just because I've learned new things, but because I've learned how much there is to learn about things. It's that whole Dunning-Kruger effect thing. No matter how narrow and specific a topic might be, there's there's always a rabbit hole. There's always some deep well of knowledge that I didn't know was there. And yeah, part of that is coming to grips with the fact that um, we are only temporary occupants of this thing we call existence. And ultimately in the grand scheme of things, nothing we do really matters. And no, that's <laughs> it's not a fun thing to think about. Actually, it makes me think of a meme that I've seen where there's like uh, an existentialist on one side and a nihilist on the other side. And the, the existentialist is like, you know, depressed and decrying the fact that nothing matters. And the nihilist on the other side is like celebrating that nothing matters. Like it's simultaneously the best and worst news you can possibly hear. Cause yeah, when I'm having a particularly lovely panic or anxiety episode, thinking about all that is not great. But you know, when I'm laying in bed at night, unable to sleep because I'm cringing about something I said to that girl in the ninth grade, uh, the idea that nothing I've ever done will ever matter is, uh, I don't know, that's quite reassuring. Now, I want to be careful and not try to make it sound like I've really got this figured out because I very don't. I, I struggle with this quite a bit. But one way of framing it that sort of helped me out a little bit is to think of it almost like a quantum reality versus macro reality thing. Like there are different levels of reality that only vaguely interact with each other and they kind of have their own rules but they're still equally valid. So, I mean, what I mean by that is like, no, the problems that you and I deal with on the grand scheme of things don't matter. You know, when you think of galaxies and the cosmos and all that, they don't matter at all. But in the micro scheme of things, the sort of quantum reality that we're living in, the way we act towards each other, our behavior, our actions, they matter a great deal. So you have sort of these two different realities, but they're both equally valid. And I don't know, maybe that's enough. By the way, this is a good opportunity to promote my new audio podcast, which is gonna be launching this week. Um, I actually talked to somebody, not on the episode that's, not on the first episode, in the second episode, I talked to somebody who has spent a lot more time thinking about this kind of stuff, and we, we talk about this. Um, I don't wanna give too much away, because it's really exciting. It was a pretty big one, but uh, I'll put a link down in the description so you can go see what the podcast is all about. You can check it out down there. John Regal also asked, why do dogs tilt their head when you're talking to them? Because it's cute and they're manipulating us. They're in charge, you know. Now I've heard is that they do that when something, when they hear something that catches their attention because it's kind of like they're recalibrating their listening device. I don't know, it's almost like echolocation. Like they, they, they move, they pivot a little bit. These are, <laughs> these are my ears. No, they, they pivot a little bit to give just a slightly different angle on the sound so that their mind can kind of triangulate and get a better idea of exactly what they're looking at or get a more accurate reading on it might be a better way of saying it. All of this is unconscious and instinctual, of course. They're just reacting to a sound that they enjoy, which is why Zoe always does it whenever I say the word food. <laughs> Mike Reed asked, will Tesla's full self-driving beta kill people or save lives? What's the future of autonomous cars and will humans drive it all in 30 years? All right, I'm gonna make a prediction real quick. Tesla's full self-driving system will absolutely lead to some deaths. I'm pretty sure I have no doubt about that. Um, I will make another prediction though. You know what else is gonna cause a whole lot of deaths? All the other kinds of cars. According to the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, 38,680 people died in car crashes in 2020. That's about 108 a day. That's with humans driving the cars. So that's how that's going. So obviously the question isn't, will it kill people? It's, will it kill fewer people? And I think over the long run, yes, that's true. 
For the simple fact that a self-driving car can see in all directions at the same time and never gets distracted, like it's almost unfair to even compare a human driver to a self-driving car on that aspect. Of course, humans have intuition and we have the ability to sort of navigate in unfamiliar places. We can kind of predict what other people will do. And that's something that we might not ever really be able to get a computer to understand in the same way that we do inherently. But on that note, self-driving cars record massive amounts of data and insurance companies can use that to tell which uh, person is at fault in an accident. And as the systems get better, I, I really do think that it's the insurance companies that are gonna push people toward self-driving cars because um, it's gonna cost less money to insure a self-driving car, not just because they might be safer further down the way, but also because they'll be able to have data on whose fault it is in an accident. So yeah, I think there'll be a time further down the road when it's just more expensive to insure a non-self-driving car than to get a self-driving car, and that's just gonna push more people into doing it. So I do think it'll be cracked, the whole self-driving car thing, um, and I do think that Tesla is way ahead of everybody else on that right now. Um, I am more cynical than other people about the timeline on which this is gonna happen, though. Like, at this point, I would chalk up any full self-driving accidents on irresponsible drivers. And, and I've always done that with autopilot as well because you're supposed to keep your hands on the wheel, you're supposed to be ready at all times to take over the car. Like I keep seeing these videos of people, you know, sleeping in the car while it's driving down the road. I don't even know how that works because it's constantly prompting you to wiggle the wheel and give some kind of response to let it know that you're, you're paying attention. I don't, I, I don't even know how they're able to do that. But, but yeah, that's just irresponsible driving. And that's what causes accidents in all kinds of cars. And look, I've seen videos of the new FSD system. Um, Gally Russell has been posting some really cool stuff about that, and it's super impressive, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm kind of blown away by where they've gotten with it so far. Um, but there's a big gulf between it's super impressive and I will trust this with my life. <laughs> and uh, I think it's just gonna be a while before we get there, before we get to that 99.9999, you know, string of nines. I think that last, you know, 10th of a percent or whatever is probably gonna be the hardest to get to. Now there's been a bit of a rumor since the last Tesla earnings call that this next car that they might introduce, the $25,000 car that we've all been we've all been calling it the Model 2 this whole time, um, that they're actually going to call it Robo Taxi, and that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a Robo Taxi, and it won't even have a steering wheel in it. And that sounds optimistic, <laughs> especially considering that you know for years now Tesla's been saying that it'll be feature ready by the end of the year, and we never quite get there. But, you know, knowing Tesla, this car might be introduced and unveiled in like 2022 or 2023, but not come out until 2025, 2026. It, it has been four years since the new Roadster was unveiled. And if you remember correctly, it, it was called the 2020 Roadster at the time. <laughs> We're now finishing up 2021. Just saying. So I don't know, considering the pace of development with FSD, maybe by the time that car is actually on the road, it'll be ready for that kind of use case, um, I guess we'll see. And it would definitely fit with Tesla's pattern of removing things from the steering column. I mean, starting with the early Model S to the Model 3, they got rid of a whole bunch of buttons. The new Model S, they got rid of the stalks, and with the yoke, they basically got rid of half the steering wheel. So yeah, I guess the next step would be no steering wheel. But ultimately, I do think that uh, self-driving cars will make the roads safer, that they will be safer down the line than human drivers, especially as more of them get on the road, and, uh, and especially if they can communicate with each other to avoid accidents and stuff. You know, humans, we are messy, distracted, unpredictable, and I think the fewer of those on the road and the more computers that are none of those things that are on the road, uh, ultimately the safer it will all be. But you know, having said that, people love driving. Driving is like synonymous with freedom. You know, they say hit the open road. It's, you know, people love that. Uh, it's, it's a, there's gonna be a lot of hesitation and resistance to it. And it's gonna be interesting for sure. But I think it's gonna be a long time before we really get there, before self-driving cars are the norm. I mean, maybe maybe 20 years even. That's just my opinion. So spaketh Jostradamus. Brian Beswick asked, if the US or other large country were to change our building codes to require white roofs, how much of an impact on climate change could we make through increased albedo? Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna go on a, I'm gonna go on a rant real quick. It has always bewildered me that of all the colors of the rainbow, that here in the US anyway, we have chosen the darkest, most heat absorbing color possible for our roofs. I mean, I get it if you're up north and, and it's cold all the time and you're trying to you know absorb as much heat as possible, but here in Texas, I mean, we spend so much time and energy and money 
on insulation in our attics and radiant barrier and stuff like that. And then on the top of our houses, we put this crazy heat absorbing tile on it. It makes no sense. I feel like there are so many like passive heating and cooling designs that we used to use way, way back in the day that we've just now forgotten and we've chosen to, to you know, heat and cool our homes by just brute force throwing as much electricity at it as possible. Um, I think it would be good if we went back and kind of relearned some of that other design stuff. Anyway, to answer your question, I don't think it would really make that much difference because the, the amount of uh, rooftop coverage, square footage, square mileage, whatever, um, is so small compared to the rest of the land. Like I found an article on Quora that used a report from the National Renewable Energy Lab that calculated about 5,000 square kilometers of rooftop space in the US. Uh, that sounds like a lot, but the total area of the US is about 3.8 million square kilometers. So that's like 0.13%. And that's not nothing. I mean, it might make a little bit of a difference, but I mean, keep in mind the US is just one small part of the rest of the world. Oh, and most of the world is uh, water. Though it might make a difference in like the heat island effect in urban areas. So on sort of a microclimate level, maybe? But it is still an interesting question because uh, putting more reflective, less heat absorbing material on the tops of homes might lower the temperature, might lower the amount of electricity needed to heat and, or to cool the homes. In fact, Brian referenced uh, this new paint by Purdue University that has apparently broken records for the most reflectivity of any paint that's ever been created. So yeah, this is from a Purdue professor named uh, Julin Ruan. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. But yeah, they've created a type of paint that reflects 98.1% of sunlight. The previous record was 95.5% of sunlight. Uh, they say it's kind of the opposite of Vantablack, which absorbs up to 99.9% .9 of visible light. And according to the professor, he says, if you were to use this paint to cover a roof area of about 1,000 square feet, we estimate that you could get a cooling power of 10 kilowatts that's more powerful than the central air conditioners used by most houses. It says that it's made with a very high concentration of a chemical called barium sulfate, and they use different size barium sulfate particles that reflects the light in different ways to scatter more of the light spectrum. Anyway, it's a super interesting article. I'll put it down in the description if you wanna go read it. But yeah, if we, if we put it on every home and every building in the US, that would definitely cut down on the amount of energy that we're having to use to, to cool our buildings. And you know that would cut down on power generation. It would reduce stress on the grid, reduce the amount of carbon emissions going up. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, it, it could have an effect on, on climate change. And you could probably um, determine a percentage reduction that it would create for a home and then extrapolate that out to the entire United States to get a full amount of CO2 that it would you know, keep from going to the atmosphere. I gotta move on to the next question. If one of you guys wanna nerd out about it and put that down in the comments, feel free to do so. Mark Hoffman asked, in the context of a billion plus years from now, if whatever became of us were able to become a type two civilization, what might be the viability of using mercury to attempt a Theia type collision with Mars? Could Mercury, given its abundance of iron with just the right impact angle and velocity, create a planetary core capable of producing a protected magnetic field? Might such an impact also be able to form a satellite coalescent accretion disk to help stabilize axial rotation? This is the most bruh question I have ever seen. Could we terraform Mars by smashing Mercury into it? Sure, why not? What, what could go wrong? First of all, let me just start by saying that if we ever did become a type two civilization, um, Mercury would be toast. I think we can all agree with that. I think I've talked about this in my Dyson Sphere video because in order to have enough material to create a Dyson Sphere around, uh, around the solar system, you would, you would need to dismantle a planet. And let's just be honest, Mercury's not bringing much to the party right now. But smashing it into another planet to try to recreate what happened here on Earth? Bruh. Okay, first of all, the axial rotation thing. I, I imagine it would be easier to just collect a lot of asteroids from the nearby asteroid belt and either form an accretion disk with that or clump it all together and make a, a moon-like satellite to stabilize the rotation that way. But yeah, to get a magnetic field working on Mars, I see what you're saying. It definitely needs some kind of a spinning core. And uh, to do that, you gotta rearrange its guts a little bit. But this, by the way, is, is arguably more important than the, uh, the accretion disk or moon bit, because uh, if we don't have some kind of magnetic protection for the atmosphere on Mars, even if we thicken it up somehow, uh, so that we could live there and terraform it, it would still get blown away by solar wind. So, so that's definitely something we would need to do. 
But a more practical approach was suggested a few years ago at the Planetary Science Vision 2050 workshop by the director of planetary science at NASA, Jim Green. Uh, he suggested putting a giant magnetic dipole at Mars's L1 Lagrange point. And this would block the solar wind from hitting Mars directly, enough to at least prevent the atmosphere from becoming eroded. This is still a massive project that we don't currently have the technology to do, but maybe in 50 years or so? Now, we would still be unprotected on the surface from cosmic rays and whatnot uh, that aren't coming directly from the sun, so we would still probably need some kind of magnetic shield sort of over where we're living, locally. Now, as for if it would work, I'm, I imagine a species advanced enough to pull something like this off would also be advanced enough to ensure that it would work with the right angle and velocity and everything. And the mass part of it, okay, so if they wanted to recreate what happened uh, in the Theia collision here on Earth, uh, so the Theia uh, planet was supposedly about the same size as Mars. So I had to look this up. So um, Mars is about 15% the mass of Earth at 6.185 times 10 to the 23 kilograms. Mercury is 3.285 times 10 to the 23 kilograms, which is 51.2% the mass of Mars. So they would probably have to whittle Mercury down a little bit to get the, the ratio just right. Anyway, they would have to be much smarter than me to pull that off. But like I said, if they're advanced enough to even attempt it, they're probably advanced enough to ensure that it would work. Now what they probably couldn't do, which is the Achilles heel of this whole idea, is um, whittle down the billions of years that it would take for Mars to become habitable again. Which, if, if making it habitable is the point, then that's probably the single craziest way to do it. Fun thought experiment though, you guys chime in what you think down below. And last but not least, Cole Parker asked, how about this? Why the hell isn't Scotland freezing? It seems to be on the same latitude of northern Maine or southern Sweden, sure, Gulf Stream, but how is that even a thing? And how f***ed are they if it ends? Someone's salty today. You seem really upset that Scotland is not a frozen wasteland. What does Scotland do to you? Okay, point on the doll where William Wallace hurt you. I actually do have a video on the way about this. Um, not necessarily, any, it's, it's on deck. It's not coming up anytime soon, but it's, it's being thought about anyway. So yeah, no, the Gulf Stream is interesting and it is weakening. And if it were to collapse, that would be bad. I think that was the premise behind the day after tomorrow, uh, which is highly regarded as the most accurate climate change film of all time. But yeah, ocean currents are weird and it's super complex. I mean, it's, it, it's fluid dynamics, it's, it's chaos. But no, I do fully plan on covering this topic in depth in the future. So I'll just kind of give a quick rundown here. So the ocean currents, uh, including the Gulf Stream, are what are called thermohaline currents. Thermo standing for temperature and haline standing for salt. And they're influenced by a variety of things, wind, co the Coriolis effect, tides, but most importantly, density. So yeah, cold water is more dense than hot water and salty water is more dense than less salty water. So thermohaline. And denser water sinks down below less dense water, which is why you can have currents up top of warm water and deep ocean currents of cold water. So the water from the tropics get a lot of sun and it warms up. And then the winds create a current that moves that hot water north along the east coast of North America. And as it moved into the North Atlantic, there's less sun, the air gets colder, so the water gets colder. And it's also thought that the winds evaporate the water, thus making it more salty. So now this colder, saltier water sinks in giant columns of water like underwater waterfalls. Apparently more water flows through this column than all the rivers in the world. And this is actually known as the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So this creates the cold, deep current that then flows back to the tropics, gets warmed up, and then the cycle repeats itself. So yeah, they actually call this a heat pump, and this, this heat pump, this system, brings as much heat into Europe as something like a million nuclear power plants. And of course, climate change is messing with this because as the Arctic ice melts, that's fresh water, especially on Greenland, that, that glacier water, it's fresh, it dilutes the salty ocean water, and um, it slows down that current, like right in that really important spot. So yeah, that's, that's not great. So we're already seeing some signs that that current is slowing down. The fear is that it could completely collapse, which would basically plunge Europe into sort of a mini ice age. So yes, ironically, uh, global warming could cause a new ice age, but that would only be take place in Europe and other places like in Africa, which usually is cooled by that cold water coming back down. Um, they could see the kinds of temperatures that would make it completely uninhabitable. So Cole, I guess if things keep going your way, then soon enough, Glasgow will be under a mile of glacier ice. Live your dreams, kids. 
But that's all the questions for today. Thanks to all the Patreon members for supporting this channel and for these great questions. I hope to do some more of these in the future. And if the idea of the Gulfstream shutting down makes you crap your shorts, well, you're in luck today because today's sponsor is Mack Weldon. As you already know, Mack Weldon makes amazingly comfortable underwear. I'm wearing some right now. I would show you, but uh, I don't think you could handle it. Also, that's, that's gross. That's... Mack Weldon's underwear is so comfortable because they design the fabrics themselves. They've got air knit to keep you cool, warm knit to keep you warm, and the silver series that's antimicrobial and prevents odor. And all of this comes together to make a whole clothing system that they call the daily wear system. It's comfortable, it's fashionable, and most importantly, it's simple. From breathable t-shirts and polos to button-ups and shorts, underwear, you name it, these clothes are rooted in smart design and made with performance fabrics that are designed to work together. Just throw them on in the morning and get on with your day. And you can get 20% off your first order if you go to MacWeldon.com slash Joe Scott and enter the code Joe Scott at purchase. So yeah, you got the holidays coming up. It's probably time to start thinking about gifts to, to get people and whatnot. This would be a good place to go. You can get 20% off and um, there's more there than you probably think. So it's worth checking out. Anyway, if it sounds interesting, check out MacWeldon.com slash Joe Scott. You'll get 20% off with the Joe Scott coupon code at purchase. Go do it. Big thanks to Mac Weldon for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Patreon supporters who are keeping things afloat, asking good questions and, and just being an awesome community. Um, we got some new people I need to shout out real quick. We've got Lilith Darkstar, dude, awesome name. Uh, v Doe, Anthony Avenier, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Tyler Eppins, Rebecca Osterfund, Seve Quinn, oh boy. Pretyush Vashnistut, <laughs> good Lord. Makermatic, the 3D printing pony and Steve Butson. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, um, access to exclusive live streams, and just Discord, all kinds of cool stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. Again, Christmas coming up. Might be some good uh, stuff there for people that might like stuff. I'm a good salesman. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this one because they've been watching you. That's not creepy. You might look down here at the side with all the other thumbnails of my face on them. And if you do enjoy them and uh, you want to be first in line to see the new videos, I invite you to subscribe. I come back to videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. Thank you for watching. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.